My name is Steve Souders. I work here at Google on web performance stuff. And last year I started this speaker series called Web Exponents. Um, and it's been a while since we had a speaker, but uh, Jason was coming to town and I got wind of that. And I saw him speak at Web2.0 Expo, uh, I don't know what, maybe four months ago. And there were so many takeaways from his talk. Um, a week doesn't go by that I don't share two or three of those anecdotes. And so it was really memorable to me. And, I, and of course, mobile is huge. So um, since he was in town, I wanted to make sure he had a chance to come by and, and share his expertise with Googlers. And then we'll get this on YouTube and uh, share it with the rest of the world, too. Um, so a little background on Jason. He's co-founder of Cloud4, a uh, development consulting firm out of Portland, um, mostly doing mobile stuff. He's worked on some big uh, mobile projects like Obama's iPhone app. Um, and I first met Jason when he came and spoke at the inaugural Velocity conference, Velocity 2008. I don't know if you remember that, up at the uh, uh, San Francisco airport uh, Marriott up there. Uh, so it was great having you there, and it's great having you here today. Oh, and I have the um, obligatory uh, Google Tech Talk goodie bag that I'll Thank present you. to you. Thank you. And then I'll take that back so you don't okay. have to deal with it. I'll right. hold it for you during your talk. So please help me welcome Jason Grigsby. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, what's in the bag? Is there something really good? Is that why you want it? You're, you're, just like, you're like taking it away. You've got another one. You've got a, he's got a dummy bag so he can switch stuff. Um, so thank you all. Can, can everybody hear me okay? I can't tell if I'm in the mic. Okay, excellent. Um, so it's a, little, it's a little daunting actually coming to the place that develops Android to talk about mobile. I mean, what in the hell am I going to talk to you guys about, right? Um, so uh, I... I was thinking about that, and, and I really, I think that the perspective that I have is a little different than probably the perspective of even the people who are working on Android every day. And it's, it's a perspective of um, talking to businesses that are trying to figure out how they're going to use mobile technology. And, um, and not, just, um, not just larger companies that are perhaps making major plays in this area, but also small companies and medium-sized businesses. And the, the reason that I started thinking about this topic and sort of framing this discussion actually came from um, a post by John Battelle. And John Battelle wrote this article. He talked about how he said, you know, give me a mobile strategy or you're fired. Uh, and the fact that there are so many companies that are trying to figure out how and what their mobile strategy should be. And, and I realized that this is a really pressing question. Um, and for those who aren't thinking about it, they people sort of jump to really erroneous conclusions, um, come up with strategies that aren't, aren't the best. Um, and the best evidence I have of it is that I keep getting email um, from, from this guy. And I'm not, I'm not talking specifically about the Geico caveman, but I'm talking about this sort of mentality. I mean, I'm assuming that these people are incredibly intelligent people, but the emails that I get are, are worded very poorly, they're very excited, they're in all caps, and um, and they, they really exhibit sort of a lack of perhaps grammar education. Um, so I, but I can understand where it comes from. And where it comes from is, this, um, is the fact that people get really excited about the fact that mobile is disruptive technology. And I use the word disruptive technology specifically because that's the way that Morgan Stanley described it um, in December of last year. Morgan Stanley published uh, 1,200 different, 1,200 pages of information related to mobile market, what's happening in that space. Um, everything from, you know, the fact that the things people really do know, although probably not to the degree that they think that they know it. So everybody knows that mobile is growing quickly, but what a lot of people don't realize is that it's growing more quickly than the early days of the internet. That iPhone adoption actually outpaces the growth of the early days. Um, iPhone adoption alone outpaces the early days of the internet. Um, and it's not just the iPhone, it's actually other browsers as well. So Opera Mini, which is particularly targeted just for a lot of feature phones, has seen 200% growth year over year. Um, and I had a slide like this last year that I was talking about. And when I went to pull this slide um, and replace it, I realized that the previous year had been 200% year over year growth as well. So they've just seen this, you know, the hockey stick as well. Why this matters, and I think this matters particularly for Google, is what Morgan Stanley points out is that with each one of these technology cycles, each one of these um, these uh, revolutions in technology, that the winners of each revolution is different. And I think for Google, 
you know, it should it should be worrisome that they're listed as one of the winners in the previous round, right? Like, I think that Google is well positioned when it comes to mobile, um, but it's something to be aware of and something to to keep in mind as as we move forward and and start thinking about what it means from a mobile perspective. Um, it also is true that, that in each one of these technology cycles that there's a massive amount of creation of wealth and um, destruction of wealth. As we saw, because the winners change from generation to generation, um, also the market capitalization is much higher. It, the companies that don't adapt to the next round um, don't do nearly as well. And each round is something like 10 times bigger than the previous round. So we're looking at something like 10 billion mobile devices when we get to the end of the mobile revolution, which isn't really that hard to, to think of when we talk about the fact that there's 5 billion devices on the planet right now. So of course what people do, what businesses do, what I see all the time is they see this information, they decide to put together a plan, so they're going to get an iPhone app and maybe an iPad app and then they're going to like integrate some social networking of some sort, they're going to put it on the app store and then of course people are going to come and they're going to make lots of money and maybe you know if they're, they're young they might decide that they're going to attract you know beautiful women and that prompts them to get really really excited and then they send me an email that's me need iPhone app, right? <laughs> And this is the email, these are the emails that I get all the time. And, and there's not, there's, I'll just give you an example of this. So I got an email from an, an agency, um, I'm from Portland, Oregon, it was a local Portland agency. They said, I've got a client that um, wants to have an iPhone app and an Android app. They need to have it in the app store in the, and, in the Android marketplace by mid-September. This was this mid-August. They don't really care what it is. Do you have anything? Do you have anything already that they could just put their their name on, and put it in the app store? And and I'm looking at like like how does this make sense? Like this doesn't make sense at all. And um, but across the industry, I see a lot of examples of businesses just just flailing about when it comes to mobile, trying to figure out what makes sense. And the thing is, is that we've actually we've been here before. So in the early days of the internet, we didn't really know what was going to work there either. And we had sites like this. And it took us a long time. It wasn't pretty. Um, but at some point, we actually got to the point where we had examples of what it meant to do a particular type of site well. Whether in this case it's e-commerce, right, and what Amazon has shown. Um, we're looking for those examples when it comes to mobile. And I think that they are, they are far and few between. There are very few companies that are across the board really integrating mobile into their strategy and figuring out how to do it well. So I've, I've collected a series of things, um, five don'ts and five do's, um, related to what I've been talking to companies about as they're putting together their mobile strategies. So the first one is really a simple one, which is to not assume that people have downloaded their app. Um, so the best example for, of this for me is that Chanel.com uh, had an app that was out in August of 2008, which is like less than two months after the App Store was launched. And it's actually, it's a really nice app. Um, fashion industry, for some reason, really gets into creating apps. I don't, I don't quite understand why, but um, they do. And they've got a really great app. Unfortunately, if you were in, say, New York, and you wanted to, to do some shopping for some Chanel products, and you didn't know that this app existed, if you did a Google search and tried to find um, information about Chanel locations, you would end up at Chanel's website, which looked like this one big flash image. There's not a single thing on it that you can access on a mobile device. So if you didn't happen to catch the news in August of 2008 saying that there was an app that they had released or you happen to think to go search for this app, there's no way to find out information about this app. Now, I put together these, I put together these screenshots uh, like a year ago or so um, and I found out recently that Chanel had redesigned their website and so I was really afraid that I'd have to take these slides out because um, they've, they've revamped it. Um, but fortunately, it still sucks. And so we can look at it and we can see that we've got text that you can't read on a mobile device. Um, if you actually go down in the bottom left and manage to figure out what you need to do in, in order to find store locations, um, you get to the store locator thing. And then in the right-hand screen, you can see there's actually a web form that you can barely make out and that it's really hard. And finally, you might actually find a location. Um, which brings us to this idea, it's in this first one as well, but not to rely on Flash um, because I know that, you know, we've got some mobile devices now coming out from Android that are supporting Flash, but it's, it's a minority of the market. Even within smartphones, it's a minority. And if you go past smartphones, it's, it's a vast minority of the market. Um, and this seems like an obvious thing, but even companies like 
that create iPhone or iPad only games. So Plants vs. Zombie is a very popular game, particularly when the iPad came out. Um, I was at a conference, people were talking about how wonderful this app was, so I decided that I wanted to find out more about it. Um, I happened to have my phone with me, so I searched for it, and the first thing I get was something that didn't even look like I was on the right page, but then I noticed the title said, you know, Plants vs. Zombies, so I'm like, all right, this is the right page. Closed it, scrolled down on the page to find the video, and then I ended up here, um, which is not at all something that I can do. So, you know, for even a company that's making the majority of its profits off of people using iOS devices is making the mistake of having flash-based video on their homepage. Right, so it seems really simple, but something that needs to be needs or that needs to be repeated. Um, the third don't is don't make finding your store hours and locations um, hard to find. Don't make it difficult. And so, in order to look at this, we're going to look at probably the worst um, uh, site on mobile devices, and that's uh, that's Apple's site. Um, so, you know, here's this great mobile company, but their own site is really horrible on a mobile device. So if you try to find their store hours, um, which I was trying to do one time, uh, you have to get way down on the bottom, there's a little tiny link, and you might find that link, and then you go to this page, and then you have to zoom in in the upper right, and then you get to this place where it's like, find your store, and then it takes you to a map. Okay, great, I got a map now. I'm gonna zoom in, uh, okay, great, Pioneer Place, that's where I wanna go, so I sort of tap on that area, and then it, it opens Google Maps. It's like, okay, that's, that's a little strange, but maybe Google Maps has a store hour. So, all right, let's just uh, route that location. Uh, so it comes back and tells me I'm 112 miles from the Apple store. Now, our office is in downtown Portland, right across the river from Pioneer Place. I mean, essentially, I could walk to this location. And uh, it's, it's come back with 112 miles from where it is. So I'm like, okay, what's gone wrong? Well. I look in here, I find out that somehow the address got translated into Madras, Oregon between the interactions on that web page and Google Maps. And I'm not sure where it broke down, but I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of you don't know Madras, Oregon. It's a small town, about 6,000 people, central Oregon, most famous for being the home of uh, River Phoenix and Jacoby Ellsby, who's a professional baseball player. Um, not, though, the location of an Apple store. So, so I go back to the, app, to the maps and I try to find it again and I'm like, okay, look, like there's this little thing over there that I'm supposed to click on that's got a description of, of the hours and I can sort of see this. So I try to zoom in and I end up in the ocean. I don't really know. I'm apparently really bad at pinch and zoom. I go back again, I see it, I zoom in and I'm so close. Can you see that, right? Like on the right hand screen, hours and information, it's right there. I just, I tap on it, tap on it, tap on it and I can't get it. So finally I give up, I go back to Google Maps, I do a search for Apple Store, I find the information, and um, there's this thing that I didn't know my phone could do, which is um, that it, it's got voice, actually, um, and I can make phone calls. Uh, so I made a phone call and found the hours. So the lesson here for me is like, Apple's got a great deal of good information, um, particularly in their guidelines, but do as they say, not as they do, because they're not a very good example of um, compelling mobile experiences. And I know now that they've got their own app where you can, you can find out store hours and make reservations at the Genius Bar and stuff like that. Um, but again, you have to know that that app exists and you have to download that app. Okay, simple to use does not mean dumb. So uh, by this I mean don't skip core functionality. Assume that, assume that a certain set of your, of your users are actually going to be on mobile devices as their primary device interacting with your service. So why is it that none of the RSS readers allow you to actually add an RSS feed while you're on a mobile device? I can consume all the RSS I want, but I can't actually add an RSS feed. Just drives me crazy. And you might think that it's because of screen size, but then you get actually and you move to the iPad apps and they've got the same issue, right? Um, and I think that this is, this is indicative of sort of following this, this idea of simplicity that Apple puts forward to a little bit of an extreme. So you can't subscribe to podcasts in iTunes on a mobile device. Um, I, and, and, you know, my friend Aaron actually, he said, um, I'm plugging in my mobile device to sync with a cable either because it's the 1990s or it's an Apple device, right? Like, and, and this is absolutely true for anyone who's, um, who's got an iPad, you, you know that your out of the box experience looks something like that. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Oh, that, what was weird? Strange noise. Okay, so um, this is because Apple's been working off of a digital hub strategy that it's had since 2001, 
right? This is Steve Jobs' keynote, um, 2001 January. He was talking about this digital hub strategy. And actually, you don't have to, all you have to do is replace the, um, the, the devices and you've got the same strategy, same sort of thing. Um, I love these, these images. I didn't actually create these images, somebody else did. But I love that um, not only have the devices changed, but the person who made the image actually made Steve skinnier. Um, you can see there. Um, which is a great Easter egg. Like I did this presentation three times before I noticed that that was the case. Um, so we, we've got this digital hub, hub strategy and it just sucks, right? If you've got, for anyone who's bought an iPad and spent the first 40 minutes waiting for that device to sync, looking at this screen before they could do anything, they know what that's like. Um, there, was a, there was a group that decided to live um, video blog their, their reception of an iPad and opening the unboxing. And so they, you know, they videotape it and they unbox it and then they hook up the cables and they're like, okay, so yeah, oh man, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. And then they hook up the cables, oh, ah, uh, great. So, uh, oh, okay, we gotta sync it. All right, so here we go. All right, it's syncing. Man, it looks good, doesn't it? It's syncing. And what's it doing, Tom? Oh, it's still syncing, right? I mean, like, it's just, it's sort of ridiculous. This is actually one thing that I think do, Google's doing much better is this idea of being able to, you know, move with these devices and actually understand that the context, that a person's primary context is often going to be on a mobile device and being able to have access to that information. Um, and as long as we're talking about things that are sort of stupid, um, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. So there's, um, there's this JCPenney's app where you can shake the app to get a random gift. And, um, and I, I keep telling people, I'm like, I, you know, I can pretty much speak for the male population on this one. We don't need any help finding bad gifts for other people. Like, it's just unnecessary, right? So, um, so this, this just doesn't do any good, right? I, can, I, I do a terribly, terribly good job of, of purchasing bad gifts for other people without assistance. Um, the fifth one is don't forget that the UN uni in URL means universal. And uh, since I'm in front of a bunch of geeks, I'm pretty sure that you all know that it actually means uniform, but that's okay. Um, so URL should go to the content, not to the mobile homepage. Right? How many of you have had this experience where somebody sends you an article or you see something on, on Twitter and you try to follow through the link and you end up on, like it's a salon.com does this. So the link is supposed to go to the specific article that you want to read, but you get rerouted to the mobile homepage because you're on the mobile device. And then good luck trying to find that content again. Um, or, you know, the actual organization has a fantastic mobile website, but the URLs always take you to the desktop web, which is what happens with the New York Times. So if you really want to get to the mobile content, you have to take that URL and edit yourself, edit it yourself in order to get to that content. Um, and the final thing is, is that URLs don't, don't open apps, right? Um, they're not going to open them consistently across platforms. So if you want to share information, if you want to be able to take advantage of social networking, you need to be able to do this. And, and I've, this is something that's really started resonating with our customers in the last year, and it didn't in the past. In the past, it was very much just iPhone, iPhone, iPhone. And I think we've got Android to, to thank for that, to get people thinking, okay, we need to support multiple devices. Um, but I'm able to say, okay, so if somebody emails you a piece of content, you should be able to open it no matter what device you're on, no matter where you are in the world. And a lot of, um, a lot of, app, a lot of businesses aren't actually building for that um, behavior right now. Another thing, and this is, I think, a, a way in which we've learned about this, um, or this behavior is that, you know, like you can't actually find out about iPad apps on your iPhone. If you try to look up something in the Apple Store, for quite some time it would just say your request can't be completed which I knew that that meant that that was an iPad app that I couldn't find the description of, but you know, somebody else, my parents wouldn't know what that meant. They've actually updated this sort of like the Chanel example, but it's still really bad. So you know, now it's like, oh, this is an iPad app and it's like, learn more about this app. So I, I tap on learn more about this app and it takes me to um, Nike's football mobile homepage where I can't find anything about the app. Um, shortly after the iPad came out, there were a lot of people who are getting mobile sites instead of full desktop versions and that didn't make a lot of sense either. Which sort of brings me to this, to this point which is that, that I think that device detection has to be a core part of people's mobile strategy. 
and it's going to be more critical going forward. Um, and I know that this is a contrarian view to uh, another set of people who are, who are sort of promoting this idea that we should be providing one set of content to people and then using things like CSS media queries to provide different versions of this. Um, it, there's a really great example of this if you haven't looked at this. Uh, Alyssa Part had an article by um, Ethan Marquette not too long ago talking about responsive web design, which I actually really like. Um, I like the idea that you have a desktop version that has a really wide view, and then if you have a smaller browser, it's a better view, you know, in that, and it sort of stretches. And, and there's actually something really nice about having having a web page that that inter, that you can interact with in that way. Um, there's something nice about watching a page respond to your touch. I think that that's part of the reason why touch devices have so much, um, uh, why people become so affectionate towards them because they, they, they are able to interact in that sort of intimate way. And the, um, the responsive web design does this. Um, and you get all the way down to, you know, a mobile size screen. But the problem is, is that, that when you go from that perspective, you're actually hiding problems. So when you use CSS media queries to hide images um, or to just use the browser to resize the images, you're delivering content that's far larger than it needs to be for a mobile device. And on devices that have um, slower CPUs, network latency issues, um, smaller bandwidth issues, this doesn't make a lot of sense. The other perspective, since I, I, post, I published an article um, calling this, this uh, technique fool's gold, um, sort of touching off a little bit of a firestorm, um, What's come out since then is people have said, okay, instead of doing it that way, what we really need to do is we need to start by delivering mobile versions of websites and then progressively enhancing them to desktop versions, um, which actually seems like a possibly a viable way of delivering it. I just don't see anyone actually doing it in a production environment. And if you care about um, if you care about devices that are that are feature phones, you're going to have to move from XHTML mobile profile as your doc type all the way up to HTML5 and somehow do that via progressive enhancement. And I just don't see that as, a, I don't see that as being likely. Um, I also think that the context, the information that you want to provide at a particular URL um, based on whether the person sitting on a mobile device or, you know, in their living room on Google TV or, you know, at their desk is a very different one. Um, while we were having this debate, Jeff Croft wrote this, this tweet, which I actually thought was really smart. He didn't say what he was talking about, but I, I kind of got the gist of it, which is that when you only work on, on, when you don't work on the whole stack, you try to solve the problems at, the, at your level instead of the level they should be solved at. And so I look at this and I actually think that we've got a huge amount of infrastructure that we need to build when it comes to mobile technology. We're at the point of mobile where we were when Apache still stood for a series of patches against, against the NCSA server. We've got a bunch of stuff to build out in order to take, um, and, and these existing content management systems that we built up over the last decade are actually, they're anchors holding us back from mobile technology. They don't, they don't, they're not able to understand what devices are, are coming to the site. They're oftentimes designed for only one style or one size of screen. We spent the last decade like incrementally moving from 640 by 480 to 800 by 600 to 1024 by 768. And then all of a sudden we've got to move down to this small screen. And before too long, we're going to turn around and we're going to be building stuff for a large screen. And, you know, um, one of the things that Scott was talking about actually at Design for Mobile recently was the idea that, you know, we're moving to devices throughout our world, right? In our cars. I mean, all of these different, all of these different spaces where we're going to be interacting, and the screen size is different. The context is different. You're walking down the street with something in your phone. You're le you're leaning back on your couch reading something on a tablet device. You're watching something, or you're interacting with something across the room that's on a television, versus sitting there at your desk with a screen. Like all of these different things. Not only do we have different screen resolutions as an option, as something we need to build for, but we have to be able to change context and change information based on that context. Which is why I actually believe that device detection is going to be part of these new platforms. Um, but even if you disagree, even if you think that we can do it with um, providing, you know, mobile HTML and then progressively enhancing it, um, we still need better systems because a lot of the content management systems that people are using, and this may not be true for Google, right, but these new systems, they really need to be able to have integrated image resizing. 
they need to have video conversion and resizing of those videos. Um, so they need to be able to put those videos in a format that can be used on mobile devices. We need to separate content from markup, right? Because if we're embedding a bunch of HTML, if we've provided somebody like, like Blogger does the ability to create content and they're using a what you see is what you get editor and they're inserting markup within that and then you want to take that and you, wanna, you want to actually provide that information, that content out and Blogger may not be a good example. Like you can pick any news site where reporters are working and providing content and they're able to bold things or underline things or make decisions about it. We need to be able to strip out that markup to go to devices that aren't going to render HTML but are actually rendering things in native code, right? Or we need to provide ways to translate which pieces of that market or markup are actually things that make sense in that context. Um, prioritization of content. So what makes sense in a mobile context may not make sense in those other contents. And I think full featured APIs. Um, and on that point, like I've become really enamored with um, what NPR has done, which is, they call their create once, publish everywhere. Um, model where their, even their desktop website does not actually have, they've completely separated, just to back up, they've completely separated their content management system from their web publishing tools. So even their desktop site consumes their APIs. So their desktop site consumes the APIs and the same APIs that they give away freely for anyone else who wants to build apps. Um, but that's not as important to me as the fact that those APIs are then the thing that allowed them really quickly to build a mobile website and to really quickly enable an Android version of their content and an iPhone version of their content. And when they move to television, it's going to be easy for them to do that as well because they haven't brought, and they even do things within, their, within the content that they write where they, they mark where the HTML tags are in um, the content and separate out the raw content from the HTML markup and then put it back together on the fly for those, for the context in which the HTML makes sense. Now I'm not saying that everybody needs to go to this extreme, but you can see how that's a much more powerful platform for moving forward into an era where we've got a multitude of devices accessing information than the scenarios where, you know, somebody's building something on top of Drupal or Joomla or these other systems where all the, everything's intermingled. And and I just, I just think that it's really nice when you give people these, these options. So ESPN, I think, does a great job of this, right? No matter what device you're on, you get a really great experience. They know that there are numerous, numerous peoples and they're seeing tremendous growth in their, their mobile usage, um, even during sporting events. So, you know, like the first time the iPad came out, it's like asking me which version of the site do I want? And, you know, no matter what version I'm on, it's consistent. And I also see that um, they do little things to make it easier. So even on this version, if you go from the desktop version, which the previous screen was, to this, you can see how they've added a checkbox just to close the pull down menu. So little touches, but it makes a big difference. And you're only doing that if you're actually doing some work to actually segment your audience based on the devices that are there. Okay, so here's some of the things that I think people need to do. Um, so the first one is know your customers and what devices they'll use. So we all know that Apple's just killing it when it comes to mobile. They're the leaders in the mobile space. They, they pretty much dominate. Um, and so I read this article recently that, that talked about how BlackBerry needed to do something um, to defend its crop, crumbling market share and that's why it had released these two new BlackBerry devices. Um, at which I was like, what crumbling market share? Right? This, is, this is BlackBerry's market share since the iPhone has been released in 2007. They're, they're, they're doing pretty good. Like, it looks like they're actually growing market share to me. Um, and you know, in Q2, they actually beat the, the industry, the analyst expectations for what they were going to do. Now, BlackBerry is having trouble, and I'm not going to ignore the fact that they're having trouble. They're having trouble in the United States in particular. Um, in the United States, they've been losing market share, but they're doing well in other parts of the world, which is why their market share is still continuing to grow. And I think they've got some, they've obviously got some issues with their legacy operating system that they need to address. But I think that, that what happens is, is that we in the United States, and in particular the tech media, has iPhone blinders on when it comes to looking at a bunch of things in relation to the mobile world. Um, you know, iPhone isn't necessarily the leader when it comes to market share, which shouldn't be any surprise to the people here. Um, you know, Nokia still dominates on that regard. And in the United States, Android has now taken top spot. Wait, is that true? No, RIM still got top spot. Um, I, I think it depends. We don't ha actually have sales numbers for Q3 yet, but the, the, um, 
I think it was uh, Nielsen had some information out recently that in the last six months, people have been buying more Androids than have been in the United States and have been buying um, uh, Blackberries. So I think we've got uh, information. I think end of Q3, we're probably going to see Android bypass Blackberry. Uh, and we've got other phones, right? So we've got Palm being bought by HP. We've got Windows Phone. We've got all these different things that, that when I'm talking to businesses, they're not taking into consideration as they're making decisions. Um, so I've been looking at this, and I've been looking at some of the other ways in which we, we have um, blinders on when it comes uh, to mobile based on what we've learned from iPhone. Uh, the first one is um, just this question of whether apps actually create lock-in. Like, you know, now that I've got 100 apps on my phone, is that going to prevent me from switching to another platform? Um, and I was, at, I was at this conference last week, and I asked people, you know, this was or two weeks ago, it was design conference, design for mobile. All these people were mobile advocates. I asked them, you know, how many of you use, you know, um, one third-party application on your phone on a daily basis? Everybody raised their hand. Like two, you know, some people took down their hands. We went up the way. By the time I got to six, there was nobody else, nobody in the room with their hand up, right? So, if we look at this, if I look at my own usage, I find that I use six apps on a daily basis, or it's five apps, sorry. And the total cost for those apps is $17. The cost for me to switch to a different platform down the road, if I decide to do so, is pretty inexpensive. Now, I've got the, the time to learn the new system. I've got all of those sorts of things. Um, but it's not as compelling. It's app login lock-in isn't as compelling as it was for desktop. Um, and I think we sort of miss, we miss think of that. We, we think that it's going to be a bigger thing. Um, I also think that, you know, a lot of people look at the, the mobile answer. Yeah? So is it, is it perfect for me to ask your question now? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So the question is, uh, are apps just content? And so, um, you know, I've got a bunch of DVDs. I don't watch them all the time, but my cost to switch to Blu-ray is, you know, or something that was incompatible with DVDs is still pretty high because I've got all of this existing content that we can't use. Um, I tend to think that it's not the same, um, primarily because I think that a lot of the stuff that people care about are are things that you can get cross platforms and then the things that you can't that you don't care about. I mean, Pinch Media did this study where they were they were looking at the usage of applications, right? And they coined this phrase throwaway apps because people would use them for one day, two days and then they just they wouldn't use them again. So I think that there's a there's a high number of apps that are getting downloaded right now that people are just, you know, it's like it's like they they're paying less for that than they pay for a pack of gum. And so does that app really prevent the person from making a decision to switch platforms? I don't think so. It's only the apps that people are using on a regular basis or apps, I think, within a niche that prevent people from switching platforms. Um, but we'll see. I mean, yeah. What about iTunes music and videos? Uh, that, that is only playable on you know, okay. iPhone and iPod Touch. Right, right. So, Right, so it's a question about DRM-based yeah. music, video, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, that, that, that very well could be a lock-in-based issue. Um, but it doesn't, that's not the stuff that you read the, the press talking about when they're talking about the mobile market. Um, so yeah, I, I would, that's part of the reason why I end up buying MP3s from Amazon instead of from Apple, but that's me. Um, Sort of continuing on this theme, I, you know, we've got this idea that app stores are essential to a platform success, and so the media will likes to um, to take this breakdown and look at the number of apps that each platform has and use this as a benchmark to see, you know, who's doing well and who isn't doing well. And I, I think that it is actually something to look at. It is something that that matters in some way in relation to platforms. But the thing is, is that we. Uh, and apologies to the people in the room, but we, I think we can all agree that Android's marketplace kind of sucks in comparison to, um, to other platforms, in particular the iPhone experience, iOS experience. Um, and, and yet this, this sucky App Store experience isn't preventing Android from completely taking off and bypassing the iPhone, right? So you know, we've had this assumption, we've been working under this assumption that that's really what matters in making 
decisions, and that's what people in the press keep pounding on, and I just don't see it being bared out by the market. Um, of course, we've got a bunch of, you know, 115 Android phones announced um, or shipping and 50 more non-phone devices, and this is several months old, so I'm sure it's, it's more than that. Um, we also tend to compare mobile to the historical PC market, which I think is a fallacy because in the PC market, we never started out in a place where we had multiple vendors um, competing, you know, with a significant portion of the market, Nokia, um, you know, uh, Apple, Google, all these sorts of positions. Um, I also think that it's much more likely to be like the, the video game market where the, the, there's like five companies that have a large percentage of the market and which ones in the lead switches from generation of hardware to generation of hardware. Um, I think that that's possibly a model that we should be looking at and thinking about when we look at mobile as opposed to looking at the PC market and wondering, you know, is Android going to win and everything else going to lose? Um, because we do assume that there's going to be a winner. And the final thing I'll say to sort of like, to sort of punctuate this idea that we're, that we've, we've miscast what um, it means in the marketplace by really sort of focusing on those historical precedents and having an iPhone based perspective on stuff is that mobile is the most Borg like technology there has ever been. So by Borg like I mean that it consumes other markets over and over again. So um, their digital cameras come out uh, I think late 90s early 2000s. Um, Phone manufacturers decide to integrate digital cameras into their phones. I think they did it in 2003 was when the first camera phones came out. It was just a dribble. By 2005, the number of camera phones sold exceeded the total number of digital cameras that had ever been made and sold, right? They completely, whoa, there's the mic. They completely obliterated that market. Uh, now, people are still buying digital cameras, but you can see how the total, like the, the number one manufacturer of digital cameras in the world is Nokia. It's not Canon. It's not, it's not um, you know, Minolta. It's not any of these camera companies. It's actually Nokia. Same thing with MP3 players. Um, Apple continues to do well selling MP3 players, but if you just limit it to standalone MP3 players, Apple's got a dominant position. If you look at phones that also have MP3 players in it, Apple's got a minority position. Um, you can see this happening right now as Garmin struggles to try to figure out what to do now that their market has been consumed by mobile phones with integration and GPS. And I think you're going to see, I was talking to somebody from Kodak who works in their, um, in their uh, division that created the competitor to the flip. I don't remember the name of the product. And she was asking what to do. And I was like, well, you're, you're pretty much going to have that market go away. You guys are chasing a market that's going to dissolve you know, and I'm not sure how quickly, but I think Flip and those other other um, camera or uh, other sort of like video camera standalone video camera manufacturers are going to go away because the phones, the cameras in our phones for video recording are getting so much better. So all of this is to say that that we could see transformations in this market happen very quickly because hardware sensors could get integrated. We don't have the lock-in that we necessarily had with other devices, and the churn is higher. People replace their phones every 18 months. So getting outside of the valley, sort of like getting out and seeing what's happening outside in, in other parts of the world really informs us and makes, helps us make better decisions. So when I talk to businesses, I'm talking about like understanding what their demographics are. So if they're trying to do stuff into enterprise, they need to make sure that they're focusing on BlackBerry because BlackBerry has 40% of the worldwide enterprise market. If they want to do something in emerging markets, they need to work on MMS-based capabilities because 80% of the MMS traffic around the world comes from emerging markets. Um, if they're going to do something in Latin America or the Middle East, they need to focus on BlackBerry because BlackBerry is actually the cool hip phone in those countries because of BlackBerry Messenger. They can get around SMS charges. In the Middle East, it's actually popular to use, um, to put uh, BlackBerry pin numbers on license plates so that people can, um, when they're driving down the road, if they think you're cute, they can get your pin number and flirt with you. And this is an example of actually social mores in those countries promoting one technology solution over another, right? Because in those countries, you can't openly flirt. So here's a way to get around that problem. 
So understanding these things makes a difference. Um, and so we talk to a lot of customers. We talk about you know, making sure that they're asking their customers what they're using, understanding how their demographics map to which platforms people are using. And um, you know, using mobile analytics, which is specific and different than just using desktop web analytics to understand what people are using on their sites. Also understanding that if they've got a site that's really horrible from a analytics perspective or a usage perspective on mobile, that they're not going to get good information out of it. Um, in the same way in which uh, web usage prior to the iPhone when the browsers really sucked was really low, if your site has a really poor mobile experience, you can't really tell much about how many people are going to use that site down the road. Um, also talk to people about looking beyond native apps to look to the mobile web, SMS, and MMS. Um, there's a company in the US that does SMS games that made $170 million in revenue last year. Um, BMW did this really interesting campaign where they took 70K in MMS based advertising. Um, they basically took, kept track of every um, person who purchased a BMW in Germany um, and didn't buy snow tires or snow chains. And then when the first dusting of snow hit, they sent them an MMS message with a photograph of the vehicle they bought and the color they bought it um, with information on the correct tires and the correct or chains, whatever it was, primarily tires, I think, that they should purchase, where they should go get it, and how much they cost. Completely actionable information, universal no matter what device the person had. Um, and you know, they translated that, that um, 70K in advertising into $45 million in revenue. Um, we all know that people aren't really using the mobile web, right? I mean, we've got people telling us to screw the web and um, that no one uses the mobile web, that it's all about native apps now. And of course, we've got the um, magazine of record in our industry declaring that the web is dead, um, uh, which of course prompted a lot of conversations on the web about that article. Um, and so here's the thing. So I have a simple challenge for those people. Um, and, and I won't even ask them to prove that people aren't using the mobile web anymore. I just want them to find a single report that doesn't show exponential growth for the mobile web. Not, not that mobile web usage is down, or even that it's down relative to native apps. Just, like, just show that people aren't using it exponentially. Because what we do have is we have Bango reporting. Bango does a lot of mobile analytics, reporting 600% um, growth last year in mobile web usage. We have Gartner talking about the fact that the mobile web is going to outpace the desktop web by 2013. Um, we have, oh, there was a slide that was supposed to be in here that's missing. Um, so just this week, uh, Orange, um, uh, reported that they were doing a study and found that uh, like it was like 70% of UK respondents said that they would prefer to use a mobile web versus an app, which really surprised me. Um, I'm planning on digging in a little bit further into that study. Um, but yeah, it's actually within just the last week um, that Orange, which is very large carrier in um, Europe, published that information. One of the other things that we know about the mobile web is that it's actually converging versus what's going on in the operating system. So in 2006, Two mobile operating systems, Symbian and Windows Phone, or Windows Mobile, had 81% of the market, smartphone market. Now, Gartner and the other analysts are, talk, are tracking 10 different mobile operating systems, and no two vendors have more than, I think it's like 50% of the, the smartphone market worldwide. Um, instead, we've got this real fractured system. Back in 2006, we also had um, an insane number of browsers, all of which were, or many of which were proprietary. So we had, you know, NetFront and um, oh, I can't remember them. They're just a bunch of a bunch of different um, uh, proprietary browsers, all of which rendered content differently. With BlackBerry now shipping WebKit-based phones, and that's where they're headed with BlackBerry Six, we now have 85% of the smartphone market shipping with Black. Uh, with WebKit-based browsers. So we've got convergence happening and divergence happening on the other side. Um, and companies are actually making a lot of money using mobile web. So Flirtomatic is a UK-based dating service, and they had 15 million in revenue last year. Um, Whitepages.com recently said that they've had a top 10 iPhone app um, reference app for two years with almost 6 million downloads. But with all, even with all that great stuff, just as many iPhone consumers use their mobile website as their app. Um, but I'm not saying that people shouldn't do apps, right? Like in the last um, year, year and a half, we've been consumed with this idea of like mobile web versus um, native apps and, and this battle between them. And 
I'm, I'm really tired of that. I think that it's, it's sort of a, a futile fight. Like, really, we need to be thinking about what makes sense. In what context does it make sense to do native applications? What, does, what context does it make sense to do um, mobile web? We know, for example, that mobile web needs to be, I would say that there's a business to be built just providing mobile websites for all of the native app developers because I believe that they need mobile websites. And I think that the number of companies that need mobile websites are much bigger than the number of um, companies that just need apps. Um, but I would also say that, that I think that Apple ended this debate. Um, and they didn't end the debate in the way in which people think they ended it. They ended the debate by releasing their guidelines for what apps get through the App Store. And finally, they came out and they said, look, if you want to criticize religion, go do it somewhere else. Right? So I don't care whether you're making your entire business off of building native apps or not. Right? If you care about freedom of speech, if you care about people having, having the ability to criticize governments, to have the ability to, um, to publish freely, to talk about things that aren't you know, the sorts of things that we can find at Walmarts, then we have to have mobile web as a viable alternative to native apps. Um, and so I feel like the debate's over. We just need to figure out when it makes sense to do which. Um, and one of the ways in which, one of the places where I think it makes sense to do this is in cases where you're building something for your most loyal customers. So eBay did this, you know, they actually have a mobile website. It's not the greatest mobile website, but it's sufficient for somebody like me who doesn't spend a lot of time on eBay and occasionally gets asked questions by people from people about, you know, is this a good buy? Is this not a good buy? I can actually go to the site and look at this and, um, and get information from them. But if somebody actually uses eBay all the time, they can, they can use this app and this app generated, I think this number is actually low. Um, I forget what it is, but it's an insane amount of money for eBay based on people buying stuff. And they've bought things like boats and um, really fancy cars and stuff using their iPhones. Um, and so they've created additional apps. Like for their most avid deal hunters, they have an app that's specialized stuff. And I think that if you're going to build these apps, you, you should reward somebody for taking the time to download it by providing, taking advantage of those device capabilities that you might not have access to in the browser. So you know, providing access to the camera like Amazon does to take, experience, take photos. Um, no matter what you do, you need to make sure that you've got a consistent experience across all these devices and in your offline. Um, I think that there's great examples of this from Amazon where no matter which context you're in, you get the same basic information about your account, about your relationship to Amazon. Um, and we see examples of how this can be done with, with syncing to the cloud via Instapaper where it keeps track of what I've read and where I've read it and these sorts of things. And so I always have access to it even when I'm offline. Um, Barnes & Noble actually does a pretty good job of this as well in terms of being able to find things, know that they're in the local store, and reserve them. So if you have a physical location, being able to tie those systems together. Um, so the final thing, um, and I'm going to have to rush through this, um, is uh, understanding the mobile context. So um, Brian Fling wrote this book. I really like this, this quote from it about um, the fact that you should create a product for mobile, don't just reimagine one from small screens, that great mobile products are created, never ported. And this is another reason why I think that, that the idea of just providing the same information and reformatting it for different screens is sort of a false notion. It doesn't make sense. Um, Tommy Ahonen, who is a great uh, European mobile analyst, has been writing about mobile for quite some time, talks about these eight mobile, eight mobile, mobile's eight unique abilities. Um, the first one is that it's personal, that 63% um, don't share their phones even with their spouses. Um, the second thing is that it's permanently carried. 50% um, of the United States admits to sleeping with their phone. Something like 90% of people admit to keeping their phone within arm's reach 24 hours a day, which begs the question, between those people who keep it at arm's length and those that admit to sleeping with it, what do they think they're doing when they keep it at arm's length? I would define that as sleeping with their phone, but they apparently have a different definition. Um, so we know that it's, it's permanently carried, that it's always on, that this is a device that actually is designed for being on all the time. Like you can leave your TV on all the time, but it's not designed for that usage. Um, that it's got a built-in payment channel. And in the United States, we tend to think of this primarily um, iTunes-based payment channels, but in other parts of the world, you know, it's very common to be able to go into a store and buy something using your mobile phone. Vending machines, uh, parking meters in, um, uh, Estonia have been converted entirely so that there's no, there's no longer the ability to accept change. Like you can only use a parking meter in Estonia using a mobile phone. Um, and there's a similar thing going on in, I think it's Switzerland. 
Um, so, you know, like this, it's got a built-in payment channel and we're just starting to get used to this. This is my favorite one. It's, it's available at the moment of creative impulse. So um, the best, best explanation I have of this is actually from an iPhone app developer who created this application called Best Camera. And the, what he said was, he's a professional photographer and he said, you know, what I realized is that even though I've got a better camera at home with all of these lenses and everything else on it, that the best camera I have is the one I have with me when I want to take a photograph. It doesn't matter what the capabilities are of this other camera. And I think that's true. Like, that's true for a whole host of applications. What's the best note-taking application, right? It's the one you've got with you. What's the best email application? It's the one you have, you have with you when you want to write an email. What's the best camera? It's the one that you have with you when you see a guy in Burning Man riding across the desert on a bicycle that looks like a camera half naked, right? That's the best camera you have at that moment. Um, and it's available at that moment of creative impulse. It's got accurate measurements. So we have, because phones aren't shared, we or commonly aren't shared, we have the ability to know that a phone is attached to an individual and be able to do more stuff with it in that way. It's got social context. Um, it's got the address book in it. And we know that access to social networks um, is tremendous on mobile devices. Um, both Facebook and Twitter seeing triple digit growth. And the first half of 2010, I've, there's actually more recent statistics on this that um, are pretty daunting in terms of the amount of traffic growth that they've seen from mobile um, just this year. Um, Facebook, the last, uh, this may be old now, saying that 100 million people are actively using Facebook from their mobile devices. I'm sure it's actually higher at this point. And the final um, unique ability is this idea of augmented reality. So um, being able to, um, and, and we really don't know what we're going to do with this yet, but I love this example from a student in the UK who talked about how IKEA could actually superimpose um, a couch from their catalog over a blank spot in the wall so that you could tell what that couch was going to look like in your living room and how that might actually make your purchasing experience better. Um, so a while back, and I'm not sure if you guys are still looking at this stuff, um, but a while back there was an article, this was actually from um, 2007, um, talking about these three mobile behavior groups. Um, so who knows whether you guys are still using it, but I really like it. Um, so this idea of repetitive now, bored now, and urgent now. Um, and repetitive now, you're looking up stocks all the time, sports scores, bored now, you're in the, the hotel, you're in the doctor's lobby, and urgent now, you're trying to find the restaurant. The reason that I like this is because we tend to think of, when we talk about mobile context, of the person walking down the street very quickly trying to find something, and that's not the most, that's not, you know, the only use case. That's not even necessarily the most common use case. In Japan, they did, uh, the carrier in Japan did a study and found that over 60% of its data usage was coming from people inside buildings. Um, so understanding how your app's going to be used and in which one of these um, sort of behavior groups I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and the final thing actually is another thing that came from Google, actually from Eric Schmidt, talking about this idea of mobile first um, and the idea that they're putting people on mobile applications first. I, Luke um, W. has this great set of slides that I, I really recommend people look at. Um, his main point is that, that mobile has tremendous growth, right? We've got all these great, we've got these constraints because of the CPU, the network, the screen size, everything else. But because of the cap we've got tremendous capabilities that we didn't have access to before. We've got access to um, the camera, all of these um, location, this sort of stuff. And that growth equals opportunity, constraints equals focus, and capabilities equal innovation. Um, his slides are really, really good, sort of talking on this point. And he, sh he shows this example of how, um, how cluttered, is it going to turn? Okay, there we go. Um, how cluttered South by, or Southwest.com's website is in comparison to what it, its iPhone app is. And how much better it would be actually if the website actually had the same sort of focus that the, um, the iPhone app does. Uh, another company that I think does a really good job of this um, is Best Buy. And I've got just a short video sort of talking about how Best Buy uses mobile. Um, let's see here. So personal. It's like with you all the time. It's an intimate experience. It's always on. It's changed the way that I share my feelings and my memories. I think I'm kind of addicted to it. I honestly, and I hate to admit this, I sleep with my phone. It goes under the pillow with me and... <laughs> and the first thing I do when I wake up is I look for that phone and when I can't find it, I freak out. Oh my God, I don't have my phone with me. Wait, what if I don't have my phone? I'm out of sorts. I'm going to drive back 15 miles so I can grab my cell phone. Trust me, I've done that a couple times. It's just the most important device I've got. You've got a computer in your hand. 
and that unlocks all kinds of opportunities. As the young people come through, they aren't connected anymore to the technology that their parents use. Because they want to be connected all the time, 24-7. On our phones, typing away, my email, my calendar, contact list. It's basically my lifeline between my friends, my family, and most importantly, my business. They see it as the lifeblood of their existence. Looking at products and researching them. You just go right to your mobile device and you get those answers. That's, to me, where the value is right now. People want to have that information hand, and there's so much capability we've got to make it serve their lives better and we need to think about how can we solve that through the phone and I think for us it does put a higher expectation from our customers you guys are a technology company or you're at least in the technology business we're putting the devices in people's hands it's kind of imperative to show them what it can do the logical thing to do is to say how much revenue will we drive through this new channel although the bigger value is helping customers shop, learn, and buy while they are mobile. I think one of the ways that you add value is you create interfaces for people to access information in a way that's not like drinking out of a fire hose. If you type in bestbuy.com, you won't get the big site itself kind of jammed into your screen. You're actually going to get a, a purpose-built mobile version. It's been simplified. The way that they've broken out all the different product categories is easy to navigate. It's easy for them to get to us. With the iPhone, what people start doing is building special applications to really get at specific needs you may have. The iPhone app is very experiential. A link to reward zone, idea exchange. We're opening up a gateway for a single brand experience. Customers want to be able to stay in touch with their friends and their family. Customers want us to be able to help them out when it comes to social networking. As Twitter, as Facebook, as MySpace continues to grow, we need to play in those spaces. With Twelp Force, we have over 2,500 employees employees answering questions via Twitter. So you've got the helpful force of our Best Buy Blue Shirts with instant access to our customers and our customers have instant access to the questions they want answered and that's really been a nice marriage. Customers want their information now. I might be at one store and want to see if another store has the same product, if they have the same price. Our job as a retailer is to create tremendous buying experience for our customers. In the future, it's going to be the retailers that connect Physical and virtual experiences and a phone or a mobile platform is going to be the way to do that. Anyone on their own device can walk into our physical stores, stand in front of a product and actually understand everything that we've amassed on the web about that product. How does the mobile phone become a payment device? It's very exciting to look at what we can do in that space. The days of plastic are numbered. It'll be pick up the phone, make the transaction from wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, in a physical or an online presence. Customers want us to educate them. It's our job and our duty to answer those specific questions that you have. They come to us thinking that we know everything. People want to sleep with their phones. Um, th that's an important device to be, uh, to be part of. And we have to be there in a way that it works for the customer. And this gives us an opportunity to design solutions that make their life easier. I can't think of a better place to catalog everything we know and just make available. Every three to six months, something new is coming out. A web browser is going to be in your TV soon. They already are in your kid's handheld PSP or their PS3. These endpoints, these user experiences are going to change every six months. We need to build for having all we know kind of in the middle of Best Buy so we can parse it off to these different places. The more possibilities there are in the world, the more pressure that puts on designing really great interfaces that let people get the benefit of that. If if you ignore that, your experience isn't going to be as good as somebody else's. I can see it, and, and we've got to be there, and I think we can lead in this area. So the, the things that I like about that video, um, in particular, I like the fact that they, they seem to actually grok what it means to be in the mobile context. They're talking about people sleeping with their phones. They talk about and provide people with the ability to, to scan barcodes and understand that they're going to be looking for more information when they're physical in the physical locations. Um, more importantly, I think it was really, it's really great to see a company that's talking right now about the fact that they understand that what devices people are going to be interacting with their e-commerce systems in six months from now are very different than what they are now. And that they have to plan for that and have systems in place that allow them to take their content and parse it out to all these different devices. Um, and just the final thing is it's such a breath of fresh air from from this guy, from these conversations, from getting these emails from these cavemen sort of saying, me need iPhone app. Um, it's a completely different conversation. People were looking at at how mobile technology affects every aspect of their business. So I go back to this question that John Patel asked, um, sort of asking what, uh, what should be your mobile strategy 
Um, and, and my answer to that question is that, that there shouldn't be a mobile strategy. Like we don't talk about internet strategy anymore. Right? Like that's not a core piece of, piece of what people do when they're sitting down and writing business plans. And the same way people shouldn't be talking about mobile strategy, it really should just be um, the strategy. It should be part of the way in which businesses are, are getting things done. So um, with that in mind, for me, when I look at mobile first, um, it's this idea that mobile is this disruptive technology, that it is by its nature going to touch aspects of, of all aspects of every business and that therefore we need to plan accordingly. We need to build businesses with that in mind and our, our infrastructure and our business processes need to change to accommodate that. That's it. Thank you all very much. That was great, Jason. All right, why don't we, uh, we've got the room for a while longer, so why don't you take uh, as many questions as you want. Um, people can come up to the mic, or if you just repeat the questions, that'd be great. All right, cool. Questions? <laughs> this is Steve's personal session. Yeah. Okay, so the question is how close are we in the U.S. to being able to buy stuff with our phones? And I think the answer is not close. Um, I, uh, the thing that gives me some hope is that um, there keeps, things keep dripping out um, from Apple's patent group with near-field communications-based solutions. And I think that um, what, we've, what we've seen by device manufacturers over the last few years is that their ability to copy whatever Apple does is getting increasingly faster. Um, so, uh, you know, if Apple's next iPhone comes out with near field communications as a capability built into it, um, I think that we're, we will see a massive surge of investment in that area. Um, and near field communications holds the best, probably the best promise for making that happen. Um, but uh, we're a ways off. Um, I, there are a couple of companies that are working on some innovative ways to like add stickers to your phones and then um, use your regular credit cards in, in conjunction with either near field or um, actually dummy cards that just like swipe but then connect to your phone in some way. Um, so I think that we could get something like that as sort of a hybrid solution in place. Um, sooner, but we've got a lot of installed merchants and just infrastructure that would need to change in order for that to happen. And Asia and Europe have at least a two-year, if not a four-year lead on us when it comes to mobile infrastructure. Other question? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the last piece about the tablet market versus the in the phone market and what happens there. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't really know. I mean, one of the things that I find, okay, so backing up just a moment, when you look at the phone market, um, uh, one of the things that, um, that we know is that the number of, um, like the usage model or the number of phones that are being purchased are really expanding quite a bit at the lower ends of the smartphone market. Um, and that in the United States, for example, uh, African-American populations and Latino populations actually use their mobile phones for internet browsing at a higher percentage than Caucasians. So, which is not something that we, we generally think of. Okay, so if you combine those two things and you look at the average price for phones, for smartphones, you see that Apple's reported average price is over $600 per phone. You see that um, Blackberries is around 300, Nokia is at, I don't remember, it's like 220 or something like that. Um, and then you've got the, the Android-based devices sort of like all over the place at that lower end, but nobody's really at that $600 price point. So when it comes to the smartphone market, Apple's sort of um, continuing the pattern that they've done on other platforms, right? They're selling stuff at, at a premium at the higher end of that, that spectrum, and they're, they've got a minority share, but a majority of the profits. Okay, that's, that's been the pattern. That's what they're doing on the laptop side of things. That's what they're doing on the desktop side. Now they're doing it on smartphones. The thing with tablets that I don't know yet is that it seems like everybody who's developing a tablet is coming out with price points that are higher than what the iPad's price point is. And my assumption is, is that in the long run that Apple will continue to have really high margins and therefore will have, um, uh, will have 
the higher base product and we'll have a bunch of tablets that are cheaper. Um, but so far, I'm not seeing that. Um, it's really early yet, so who knows exactly. Um, I also think from a, just a context in terms of developing stuff for those devices, it's just too new. Like nobody, I mean, we're still grappling with what it means to design something for a screen that's this size. Now we've got this size that's, you know, what are the contexts in which it's being used? Um, so I just, I don't know, I guess it's the ultimate answer. That is, that is the rumor. Like I haven't seen, I've also seen rumors of price points that are higher. So his comment was that there's a lot of seven inch tablets that are coming in. Um, I'll admit that I've been traveling a lot in the last two weeks and that means that I'm backed up on my RSS feeds and that mobile moves so quickly that that means that I'm like a thousand items in my RSS feeds down. So there may be prices that have come out. I saw the Samsung Galaxy tablet at, or tab, is that what it's called? Tab? Yeah. Tab, yeah, at, um, at Design for Mobile. Somebody had an, an example of it. It was, it was pretty cool, I liked it. Um, but again, like the rumored price points on that are higher than the iPad and have subsidies attached to them in terms of um, being connected to a carrier. Uh, and so I, I really don't know how that's, going to, how that's going to work out. I'm kind of assuming in the long run that Apple will continue to maintain its high margins and that other companies will exhibit their usual behavior, which is to cut their margins and compete in order to gain market share, in which case um, we should see something fall out like the rest. But if for some reason Apple's actually got production costs on the iPad really low, and other companies are having trouble competing on a price point with Apple, that would be, I think, a real game changer. Like if you're looking at anything, like Apple's got a lead in that space, but it's had a lead in other spaces before. I don't know that that necessarily means that they'll maintain that lead, but if you're looking at something that would actually cause them to maintain that lead, if they're actually at lower price points than the other tablets, I think that that really would. I think that that's, that would be a very, very different dynamic than anything we've seen so far. Oh. So, so, okay, so the question is um, talking about designing for different device classes and, you know, like it's very expensive to do so, you know, how many, how many device classes do you design for, what do you do? Um, so first I would say that, that I think that it's expensive right now partially because we've got the infrastructure issues because we, we haven't, um, in the same way in which going back to the early days of the internet, just getting a, just getting a web server up and running and running Apache was expensive. Right, like um, the previous company that I was at, I was part of the management team at that company. You know, when the company was started, you basically had to build out your own server infrastructure. You had to do all this sort of stuff, and now you just like you throw it on Google's cloud or you throw it on Amazon's cloud. So every technology wave, I just I just want to make this point real quick that every technology wave, there's usually two cycles to it, and the first cycle is the cycle where the roads get built and automobiles sell, but then there's a bust. And then the second technology boom is a longer sustained technology boom where more and more people get the technology, right? And we saw this actually with the internet as well where the first cycle was where all the infrastructure was built. The second cycle is where sustainable businesses were usually built. I think we're gonna see the same thing, unfortunately with mobile, where we've gotta do a bunch of infrastructure build out before we get to the point where developing things for multiple devices on a variety of different platforms is easy to do. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Like I, I have some, I just know that what we've got right now is not going to be satisfactory for being able to design things for multiple devices. And there are a lot of different ways that it could be accomplished. Um, Steve has some ideas. Um, I have some ideas, um, PPK, has some ideas like we've got a bunch of different people who have ideas I you know like I just I'd, I'd love to just be like to step ahead five years and be able to be building in that space but that's not where we're at as far as what we do it depends on a client by client basis right so we've got one client whose goal was to reach as many people as possible because they're trying to promote social change and so in that case we did a 128 to 176 pixel um, design cla device class which sucked 128 is an incredibly, incredibly small screen, like you can't do jack with that. Um, and then a 240, and then a 320 um, non 
like non WebKit based smartphone class and then a 320 WebKit based smartphone class. Um, for another client, they went out and they bought uh, 500 3G iPads because they were going to go do some sort of um, uh, canvassing related sort of thing. Um, and so with that in mind, we were just designing for that one specific use case. Um, so it, it really just depends. The more common thing that we're seeing is, is, that, um, is that we're designing stuff sort of in um, two device classes, maybe three, where the two, two device classes are, um, there's two smartphone device classes where one is sort of a, um, a modern smartphone. So you've got the, the iPhones, Androids, um, Palm, um, you've got these devices that can handle um, uh, WebKit-based interactions pretty well. Then you've got the Blackberries and Nokias and things like that, um, but have the same screen resolution. And then as a secondary thing, they'll, they'll sort of do a lightweight mobile, which goes all the way from the very small dev device classes to like the older Blackberries that are 240 pixels and, you know, like ship with JavaScript turned off and stupid things like that. Um, another question? Then, okay. Uh, do you, have you thought about that or know anything about yeah. that? Yeah, so the question is about Windows Phone 7 and its browser. Um, so Windows Phone 7 uh, has Internet Explorer. It, has, it is the only smartphone platform right now that's not, uh, not shipping WebKit based. Um, it, it actually will be interesting to see what the WebKit numbers are, you know, in six months from now, a year from now, once we see how Windows Phone 7 does in the market. Um, it's actually possible that WebKit could gain some ground because part of what um, keeps it down right now is that you've got a lot of Windows, um, Windows Mobile users um, and Windows Mobile companies that purchase Windows Mobile because that's where they've built their, their sort of internal internet systems on. Um, but they're not going to be able to take those applications directly to Windows Phone 7. It's actually a completely different platform, so it's not really clear what they're going to do um, as far as supporting those, those enterprise users. Um, Windows Phone 7 runs Internet Explorer uh, something between 7 and 8. So essentially about, you know, like between the, after 7 was released, but before 8 was released, they grabbed a, a bit of the code, they, they forked it, and they started working on the, um, the mobile browser. Um, I had my hands on a test device recently, and I ran Asset Test 2 and Asset Test 3. And it didn't pass either of them. Um, the smiley face was not very smiley. Um, so yeah, so I think that that is going to be an issue. Um, but this is the one context in which you know, like, if you're going to build stuff and you're going to sort of like do that segmentation that I, that I was talking about, where you've got like a modern smartphone class, which are the WebKit-based sort of ones, and then you've got a smartphone class that's for devices that aren't quite that capable, um, you know. Internet Explorer is a minority market share when it comes to mobile. Like, um, if we want to do stuff with HTML5, I don't think that Internet Explorer on mobile holds us back. And I think that 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 Microsoft has shown that it understands that it's an underdog now, um, in a lot of ways, even though it still has its issues. But it, it, I think it's legitimately an underdog, and so consequently, it's acting like every underdog does, which is that when you're an underdog, you gravitate towards standards as a way to compete. And so they're gravitating towards HTML5 and Internet Explorer 9, and hopefully they will uh, rev the mobile browser to support HTML5 um, more quickly than they got rid of IE6. I know that's not saying much since IE6 came out before 9/11, but um, we, you know, like I think that there, I, th I don't think that it's going to be a decade before we get a better browser on from them in that regard. I think that it's, you know, going to be a year, maybe two, but that's just I have no inside info on that. The device itself is actually really cool. Like, it's the first, um, it's the first mobile phone that's come out post iPhone that I think has an opinion. I don't know if I agree with the opinion, but it's got, it's got a freaking opinion. Um, which I really love. Like, I mean, it's not like the the, the bot OS, which is you know, like uh, Samsung's really great at copying Apple's designs, but um, but the Windows Phone is like, wow, like somebody somebody really they they designed something different, and uh, it's really cool in person. 
I don't know how it'll sell, but it's, I mean, it's pretty slick. So uh, we probably should wrap it up, I think. Um, thank you all for your time, and um, yeah, talk to you soon. <laughs>